it's time for the fabled uh, fireside chat. Uh, I had actually added a wish list item to our conference team that we have an actual fire for this. And look, there it is on screen. Um, oh, Joseph, you're on mute. I, I'm saying it's amazing what you can do in virtual environments. It sure is. I know. Imagine what we could be and we'd be warming ourselves by this this fire pit. Maybe in, in maybe at ISTE. It's gonna be hot at ISTE this year, I think. But I don't think we need a fire pit at ISTE. You don't need a fire. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, this is a good transition. So and actually having Steve go and then you make so much sense. You know, he has obviously drawn so much from ISTE. Um and uh and and your the the name Misty has been invoked several times already today so it's only fitting that that you join us for this conversation here um let me do just a quick formal intro so people know who you are um my guest here today is joseph south who's the chief learning officer at ISTE, the international society for technology and education for those who want to know the acronym um, I think if you work in ed tech, the chance, chances are you already know about SD. Um, but previously, Joseph was the director of the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education, where he was an advisor to the Secretary of Education and developed national educational technology policy. Um, he's helped state and local leaders transition to digital learning um, and opt, adopts rather open educational resources. And he has helped build a robust ecosystem of ed tech entrepreneurs and innovators. Um, really, he's worked at every angle of ed tech, from networks and devices, professional development for teachers, and access to content in classrooms everywhere. Um, so you can see why he's really just an ideal fit for our conversation here today. So at this point, the purpose of our chat is to zoom out from everything we've heard so far and consider paths forward for XR and school systems. So given all we've learned over these many decades of adoption of ed tech, um, patterns of emerging technology that became successful whether you measure by the, the amount of adoption and or impact metrics. Um, what do we need to be careful and avoid? What can we do better as we're sort of at the at the bottom of the mountain with XR? So um, with that, um, Steve, uh, to Joseph, I'll uh, hand the mic to you. Great. And this is a conversation. So I'm, yes, I'm not a conversation. Planning, you get to take a turn. <laughs> not planning on any monologues here. No worries. So, so first of all, I just have to say how impressed I am with the other speakers. And, you know, I, I had a list of like 20 points that I thought were really important to be made. And I'm pretty sure we checked off like 18 of them um, throughout the day. So, so that just speaks to the quality um, um, of, of who you have, um, assuming that the points were quality, but I sure hope they were. Um, you know, I think one thing that really comes to mind with this is that you know, every technology adoption follows a very similar pattern. And some of those things are, are inevitable, right? It's, it's, it's always going to start out expensive and it's always going to get cheaper, right? It's, it's um, always going to be, there's always going to be a novelty effect that's going to carry it for a while and then that's going to fade and then there better be something substantive or it's going to go away, right? There's, um, you know, these sort of set patterns in the way things are, are adopted. But I think there's also a set of practices that we do sort of, um, you know, it's it's almost like a reflex that that don't have to be the case. Um, and and those are the ones that I'd like to see us interrupt. So, for example, um, you know, where is the first place the new technology is going to show up? Well, well, everybody knows the answer to that. It's going to show up on Steve Isaac's desk, right? Um, because who else would you give it to? Of course, you could give it to Steve. He's like got it together. He's like the innovator in your whole school. Well, OK, I, I get it. But what if you gave it to Steve with the challenge to start using it in the special ed classroom? Or what if you gave it to Steve with the challenge to have the first set of students to use this be first graders in your most challenging Title I school? We can make those choices. Those choices aren't made for us. They're, they're not made by the manufacturer. Um, these are choices that we can make that helps us start to center more equity in the adoption process. Because otherwise, what happens is not only are the people, no offense to Steve for the record, Steve's a good friend, love you, Steve. <laughs> um, but I think Steve would agree with this point is if we put the early adopters in the, in the white suburban schools, then not only will they shape who they serve with that, but the feedback that we give to the developers will all be from those set of students. And so they're actually shaping the whole field, right? So I think the very first thing we need to interrupt is who we use this with first. 
Um, and, and that can set us on a very different path. Yeah, Joseph, thank you for starting off with that. I think that gets lost in the shuffle over and over again as we prioritize the new innovation, the newfangled development, the thing that captures a lot of attention in the marketplace and in front of you know everybody's eyes, but maybe does not serve kids well. And um, how we um, design for the kids who are tend to be less served is always an afterthought. We're always playing catch up. Um, yeah, I was and, and there's, so go there's, ahead. There's a really important development theory called designing for the edges, and you, you've, you're probably familiar with it. That was in my notes, actually. Oh, asked, great. Um, the same. Then I probably shouldn't have interrupted. <laughs> no, 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 go. Keep going. Keep but, going. you know, I, I think this is something for us to really think about, that, you know, we, we, we have all been conditioned to design for the average. And if anybody hasn't read The End of Average by Todd Rose yet, it's, it's got to be number one on your reading list. Um, put it to the top of your pile on your bedside. But we design for the average and the average literally doesn't exist. There is no average student. But if you design for the edges and you're designing for, for as many use cases as possible, and that's gonna open up all kinds of possibilities. And some of the most exciting technologies that we all use every day were originally designed for edge cases. Um, and so again, that's another approach that we can take. Joseph, I was wondering if you have any examples of uh, successful development for in that way. I mean, so many, again, rather than always playing catch up, um, are there particular technologies that were developed for, for example, special education or practices that were adopted at the school level that might be models for us to think about, even if it's not a one-to-one -one model um, where we might learn something about how we take steps forward as a community here? Oh, sure. I, I mean, I think speech recognition, you know, is, is a really great one. Um, you know, that that was something that got its first um, first applications in some special ed classrooms um, where, you know, there was a, where typing wasn't really an option or, or writing was difficult. Um, and I think that that's something that has, has really spread spread over. I also think, you know, I mean, we a lot of things around, um, you know, icons and how they're designed to be universal, um, you know, we. we I think universal design for learning is a field that probably many people on this call are familiar with, but the, a lot of those developments um, came from those sort of situations as well. And so there, there's, you know, in the end, the things that help those with the most needs tend to help us all. Um, and I think there's another issue too, which is, you know, to some extent, there's a much broader neurodiversity than we acknowledge in the school, right? We have we have a certain number of, of students who we identify as neurodiverse and we provide them special, you know, special services. But you know, that that's just a matter of of where you draw the line on the bell curve, right? If you if you draw the line narrower, you have many more um, shades of neurodiversity in a school. And so I think when we design for the edges, what we're really doing is finding our way towards the center. Um, and, and that I think is a really powerful approach. And I think what you're saying, if I'm hearing correctly too, is that it's not just that you're doing the right thing. Of course, we should be doing the right thing because we're, we're working hard to serve the kids who are the hardest to serve, let's say, in a, in a learning environment. Um, by designing for them first, but ultimately that all, by doing that, you then reach the most kids, right? And serve the market the best. Yeah, and I, I guess I would also say that if you do it this way, you tend to design for the students that school works the worst for. And, right. and, and I think we need to remember that, you know, school has um, calcified around abstract knowledge acquisition, right? That, that, that's what's at the center of, of learning in school. But we all know that's not in the center of what is needed in our lives, right? And that's that's why in the previous century, we developed these things called 21st century skills, right? That we were all going to get. Well, you know, it's 21st century. We're, you know, unfortunately, we're like 20% of our way into it. And we're still, still chasing these elusive skills. And, you know, when you think about it, those skills are not measured on standardized tests. They're not, they're not in the textbooks right? They're, they're, they're literally, they fall outside of the formal constraints of teaching and learning. Well, it turns out that a lot of students 
A, you need to develop those, and B, given the chance to develop those, will find new pathways into the formal school system that work for them. And so not only are we bringing more people to the table, we're actually widening our arms around the number of students we can engage in school, period. Um, if they can find a reason to be there, then they're much more likely to be successful in those abstract curriculum areas, which personally I think could use some updating. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting because social emotional learning has been, you know, in, in under many different names over the years has been something that's been held out there as, a, as an important goal, not really a school a, goal, a level at the level at which schools were being evaluated, right? So if it's not being measured, it doesn't necessarily get done. And also I think looked at pejoratively in some context because therefore it's, you know, soft skills or, you know, it would be nice to have these things. Um, whereas I was reflecting on the, the rest of what was said today and what the educators talked about too and others is this idea that kids, obviously motivation is key as you, as you mentioned, but also that it gives kids these real world skills that like anyone who's had a job realizes is, is you know vastly more important in some ways than what 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 history you remember, um, not to not to impugn history also very important, but this <laughs> idea that um, that kids become very thoughtful about designing for an audience or collaborating on a team or testing and iterating on an idea or be just frankly being more open to exploratory experiences and trying and failing. Um, which we all know is more important than almost anything. Yeah, and so I think, so there are entire learning theories that have been set aside because school can't accommodate them, um, but XR can. So, you know, one that that is, has been around, you know, for probably 50 years now is situated cognition, which is John Seeley Brown, right? And And, you know, it's the whole notion that knowing is inseparable from doing. Um, and that it's situated in social, cultural, and physical contexts. Well, you know, you can't execute that very well in a classroom with four walls and desks facing forward, but you can 100% execute that in, in XR environments, right? And so it gives us a chance to bring these things to the fore. And one of the things that happens is when you start really focusing in on situated cognition, you start to believe that knowledge is not contained inside each one of us as individual vessels, but that it's shared in a community that we engage in, then you start to realize that the way we're doing school is inadequate. It's impoverished in that way. And you start to shift your focus from, from knowledge acquisition to the development of expertise. And knowledge is a necessary but insufficient component of expertise development. Um, but the reason we focus on it is because our classrooms are so sterile, right? But XR helps us bring the richness, the real world, into that arena where we can start to expand our skills and integrate those skills. And then all of a sudden, learning science or even learning history is not different from learning 21st century skills because they're happening in a rich environment. I love that vision of trying to kind of transform learning more from the inside, you know, in ways that are empowering and recognizing how learning actually happens, where kids actually leave a learning experience with some kind of something that they can actually do and accomplish. And that knowledge is not necessarily an inert thing that's just going to be kind of turned back uh, in, in, a, in a more um, impoverished way, you know, like on a, a test or a short essay. Um, one thing that you're, what you just said made me think of is, is the burdens we put on educators. That obviously the last uh, two years of schooling in this country and, and everywhere has been on the backs of educators who had to figure out how to teach virtually from a distance um, without a lot of time for preparation or support, you know, teaching hybrid environments with some kids in the room and some online, um, figuring out how to adapt lessons every day for this. So. I would say we're dealing with an exhausted workforce and, and it's in the news a lot. Um, how do we make something like this, you know, where you don't want to necessarily come to a school or an educator and say, by the way, we're going to change everything. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. But actually to give them some sense of pathway and inspiration and making it relevant to them as people. Um, we talked a lot about empowering kids today, but also empowering um, educators. I was curious to know what you were 
what your thoughts might be about that. Yeah, so so th that's a fantastic question, and and it's a really important one to ask, um, especially with new technologies that are just being adopted. Um, so I think first of all, you know, dropping a an Oculus in a teacher's lap and saying do something with this, you know, um, is is not going to help their their uh, their burden, right? It's, it's going to add to it, um, and so so one. I think I think it's on us as schools and leaders to you know do some uh, triage of that experience and say you know how how can we first listen to the educators and find out you know what they would like to be able to do with it, what their learning goals are, and then bring the technology to them. You know the classic mistake we make with every new technology is we drop, you know, 100 X's into your classroom. And we've done it, we've done it with every technology. We dropped, you know, 100 Chromebooks, we dropped 100 iPads, we dropped 100 Apple IIe's, we dropped 100, you know, Commodore 64's, we dropped 100 uh, slide projectors, right? We, we, uh, 100 whiteboards, like, or um, sorry, smart boards. Like we've done this all that, we, this is all we know how to do. Um, is to parachute in the technology. But if you'll start with the pedagogical goals, start by asking the teachers what they want to do with it, and then get, you know, do some preparation and then bring it to them, that helps. The second thing that I think um, can really make a difference is, you know, I don't think there's an exhausted teacher who wouldn't say that they would give anything to have their students show up 100% excited and ready to be there and ready to learn, right? And so to the extent that we can provide them tools that enable those engaging learning environments, then they're going to be more excited about bringing in some of the overhead of supporting them. Now, just to be clear, you know, there's been super excited kids in one room schoolhouses, right? So, so it's the technology by itself doesn't create the excitement. And I'm not interested in the novelty effect either, because again, that lasts for not very long. But you can enable environments that have, you know, a narrative in them. A narrative, as we know, compels all of us and has for literally thousands of years. And now you bring that to the classroom and now you're giving the teacher a new tool for that kind of engagement. Um, I'm, I'm smiling partly because what you said resonated so much and partly because of Kai Fraser's comment that teachers are screaming at what doesn't about at them at what doesn't work right that like the story of technology new technologies is inevitably it doesn't work or it's hard or it breaks down and so in some ways you're kind of trying to give teachers some courage and support and flexibility um again going back to the idea that it's okay to like mess around like Mimi Ito's group would say or fail um and creating that culture which does not particularly exist in school systems um uh, so this leads me to another topic that you and I have covered a little bit, which is empathy. Um, that was a, a, a key at the very beginning. I don't know if you got caught the first keynote um, where Gabo shared about some of the, the, the media work that he's done for, the, for, um, for global audiences that to help build empathy toward different, um, different people, different cultures, and uh, how, um, how do we approach uh, and uh, uh, this sort of idea of practicing empathy, or how does that pedagogically fit into schooling in a way that actually is something else that maybe people really would want if we can do it well? Yeah. So, so just to contextualize this, um, you know, I, I, I'm actually hugely skeptical of new technologies. I know nobody would believe that given my career and my profession, but I've just seen so much expensive garbage, yeah. right? I think and, that makes you perfect for your role, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and, you know, what, what we tend to do is we tend to copy and paste what we did before, only much more expensively, right? Um, and so, you know, and, and honestly, I, I saw some early metaverse demos and, you know, I was so proudly shown an exact replica, brick by brick of a campus and and they, and we were flying through the chemistry lab where there were 50 chemistry tables with you know sinks and they were saying this is exactly what it is on campus and all i want to say is why 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 is that exactly what it is on campus you can make an infinite number of chemistry tables do you want a chemistry table maybe you want to fly through a molecule right <laughs> and and so so that's that's the background for this right 
And what we need to do is is come at it in a in a really different way. Um, and um, sorry, I got so involved in that idea that I lost my train of thought. So can you ask your question again? Sure. It's about picking empathy as a practice. Yes, empathy. Great. But there are some things that you can actually do with VR that you can't do any other way. And and empathy is one of them. Um, and the you know part of the issue is this is another issue I have with school is school asks for a tiny slice of who we are. It says, hi, can I have the achievement oriented, rules compliant, sit quietly, face the front of the room version of yourself, please, Joseph? That, that's the part of you I want, right? The rest of you stays in the hall or better yet, off of school grounds where I don't have to deal with you. Um, when you bring in something like VR, you have the chance to engage all of that student. And when you have the chance to engage all of that student, you have the chance to bring them other people's full experiences, right? And you know, I bet you've had this experience, Michael, where you put on VR headsets and you looked in the mirror. And for me, I was an African-American woman. And you know, honestly, just looking at myself in the mirror for like five minutes as an African-American woman, I'll never think the same way about race, about gender, about my self-perception, you know, and that, that's not even the simulation that followed, right? Where people treated me like I was that person. Um, and so I think we need to think of um, developing pedagogies of empathy um, and, and embedding that into what we do, because this is something that, that you can do that involves your entire being and that VR allows you to do. And I think the storytelling component that we've touched on a few times today brings that forward too, as kids could potentially be creating those experiences for each other, right? That a day in my shoes, um, getting kids whose stories may not otherwise be heard have a platform for sharing with classmates and teachers, like what, what it's like to be them. Yeah, and if you think about it, there's not a lot of technologies that by default communicate that your perspective matters and that your perspective is equal to others. Right. And XR does, right? Like at the core of that idea is that you are in a context, you are, are in a context. And so it suddenly puts you on equal footing with every other person who's in a context, right? And it allows you to project your reality just as much as other people can. And so I really agree with you. I think um, the idea of narrative as a pedagogy is something that we need to look a lot more deeply at um, moving forward. This is a, you know, pedagogy, as I've mentioned before, it's literally how we passed our history on, before, you know, pre-writing, right? Pre Prehistoric history was passed on through narrative and that, and we're wired for it. And if we can bring narrative to our learning and AR and VR is a really powerful way of doing that, then we can tell each other our stories in a really powerful way. Um, I, I love that. And I think it's it's so interesting to hear this coming from you. I mean, I know you and I know that this is naturally coming from you, but at the same time you represent ISTE, which is to me also represents this massive scale of ed tech. Everybody who's in the pool, uh, educators and schools and all the, all the people who surround them, state level, uh, departments of education, um, the, the market, uh, who makes content, um, and your standards, of course, in, in pointing us uh, in a direction, let's say. What, what's the, how do you, how do you leverage the, the power of ISTE in a way that helps us think about those things? Well, so I think one thing that was made by um, a couple of uh, previous speakers who I promised I did not pay um, is that the ISTE standards um, are all about um, roles that students can take on that empower them, right? And so, you know, one of those is a knowledge constructor with the idea that the student creates their own knowledge. Um, another is innovative designer. It, it puts the student in the seat of a designer, not as a consumer, but as a creator and designer. Another one is creative communicator, right? It, it re, um, 
reestablishes your relationship with technology around relationships, right? So much of our relationship with technology is around algorithms that are optimizing a certain, you know, the exact words or letters to appear in front of our eyes at the exact moment so we can quote, learn that thing. Um, but the ISTE standard says, no, relationships are at the center. How does technology enable those relationships, expand those relationships, right? And, and I think VR and AR and XR can be designed about around relationships. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, basically we're turning the screen around. Instead of saying, you need to sit and watch and listen to this screen and it's gonna be amazing because there's technology in that screen. It's saying, hey, here's a screen and you can do something with it. You can use it to express yourself. You can use it to solve a problem. You can use it to learn and communicate. You can learn it to reach far out, literally all around the world and bring things back that you want or the, that you need. Um, and so I think, you know, reestablishing the goal of the technology opens up these new possibilities. It does. It's funny because you've been around as we all know long enough as we ha as I have too, to see all of these wet technology waves come and go. Um, by the way, my first school computer was a TRS 80 with a cassette t tape drive, which ages me a lot. Um, but I was there for that. Um, but anyway, there are a lot of really wonderful comments in the chat right now. I, I don't imagine that you've been able to read them, but just to surface a few points, Yulian mentioned that authoring tools are key to help teachers and educators shape what they need for themselves. And Tommy uh, mentions that a big concern with teacher adoption is their own sort of self centered, your egocentric notion of I'm, I'm not ready for this. I'm not, you know, I haven't been supported or trained or the district doesn't doesn't understand what I'm trying to do. Uh, Kai mentions the, the venture, you know, investor community not really getting school at all. And like what what learning objectives are matter, um, why they matter and how they matter. And, and it sounds like it's an uphill battle no matter what. Uh, yes. And then there's some love letters to ISTE as well. So, um, so I think I think what we're hearing is that there is this disconnect and some some it's not just like how do we get the how do we fit this in the right box yeah. in education but how do we actually take advantage of the transformative potential and the things you're talking about here oh. um, like actually maybe this is a good moment to ask you what what what's your um, what does this mean like what would you like to see happen I think I heard I heard it across everything you had to say today but it's yeah. Your so, point so, might be a parting thought for us. Yeah. So a few things. One is, if you are an a you know a, a developer, then then please please bring educators and students into your development and diverse educators and students into your development. Uh, just just help us all by starting there. Um. Two, you know, when when you think about um, these technologies immediately you rethink the affordances, right? Because you can suddenly do things with the technology that you can't um, with the old technology. And so that part's easy, right? You're like, oh, I'm going to swim with the sharks or, you know, I'm going to walk around on Mars. But what you don't think about is the goals. So you don't think, oh, I can, I can accomplish different learning goals because of this technology that I couldn't before. So I would say seek out those goals that were impossible before. Um, and, and push towards those. Um, and then I'd say the third thing is, um, you know, it, technology can either, you know, make it, make a more narrower and narrower and narrower, narrower uh, user base, or it can make a wider and wider and wider user base. And that is up to us as the designers, right? And so when we, allow students to co-design with us, when we allow teachers to co-design with us, when we make sure that there are the most diverse voices possible, then we design that technology to widen the aperture rather than narrow the aperture. And you know, if I, if I were involved in new technology, I'd be asking myself every day, is this decision I'm making narrowing the aperture of who can participate or widening the aperture of who can participate? Um, I think who can participate and at what level is the name of the game, it sounds like. That, that is just, uh, I think, that I really appreciate the, the way you've kind of centered people again as we kind of wrap up the formal part of this discussion today. Um, it has lots of implications for how schools operate, 
the skills educators need and their orientation to learning and to kids um, in ways that that's really inspiring. Um, I hope I hope some of this is happening at ISTE. Uh, it's in June, right? It's just uh, another month away or so. Yeah, no pressure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> last last week, New Orleans it should be it should be hot, humid, and completely awesome. Yes. No, I, I I'm starting to feel a little bit of FOMO. Maybe I need to figure out how to get there. Um, but uh, Joseph, uh, clearly, and I don't know if you again when you have a chance to look at the chat, you'll see what people have been saying. But this has been totally inspiring, and I think really did wrap uh, put a wrapper around what we what we talked about here today. So I want to thank you for being here with us. Thank you. This has been a fantastic conversation, and my hats is just off to all the previous speakers who are doing the the hard work. Thank you. I feel that way too. And look, our fire came back. So um, oh great. There we go. I think it, uh, we've, we've been warmed. All right. Thank you again.